And the next one after that, too, this is Golden Fleet. There you go. Basically, in the 2012-2013 school year, which obviously is the one we are in now, um, all students in grades three through eight will be taking the mathematics and the reading PSSAs as they have since 2002. <coughs> in grade 12, the PSSA retest is in October, and this is the last year for the PSSA retest in October. Um, However, uh, we will be giving it again this year, and as you are aware, it is for all students who did not score proficient or advanced on the 11th grade PSSA, they give them an opportunity to retest in grade 12. However, it does not impact our AYP score that we received um, for the 2012 school year. Grades three through eight and 11, um, they will be taking the PASA, which is, I call it the modified, I know it's not the, PA, the PSSA M, um, but it's for a select group of students. 1% of the uh, population can be included within those scores. Grades five and eight will be taking the writing PSSAs. Grades four and five, excuse me, four and eight will be taking the science PSSA. Grades four, eight, and 11 will be taking the science passive if eligible. There is no longer the PSSA modified, uh, which I always call it was the in-between test. That has been eliminated this year. And certainly, Dr. Soltis, if you'd like to. I call it the PSSA light. OK, PSSA light. Um, do you know why they decided to rid? My guess is right here, no one's answered that question. Okay. It can only be hypothetical and think that it had to do with the finances. Oh, OK. Um, but that has been eliminated for this school year that we're presently in. In grades three, three, three through five, the standalone writing field test will be given. And then we will be spending a few uh, minutes talking about the Keystone exams, which will be administered this year in Algebra One, Literature, and Biology. And throughout all of this, I'd like you to keep in mind that we have 181 days of instruction here with Trip. Real quick, if you go back to that, I, I think uh, what you can see is that in three through five, they have a writing field test. The reason they have the writing field test in grades three through five is because what it, what it doesn't say up there is that there will be a field test embedded within the PSSA you know, our third through fifth grade students take this year that's aligned with the Common Core Standards. And so uh, they are field testing within that. Uh, next year, the thought is to combine that into one assessment drop the fifth grade writing for next school year and have an English language arts assessment. And so what will happen is embedded within the PSSA for third and fourth graders, as well as the fifth graders, will be writing components that will measure the writing. And so, so they are not getting rid of writing, as you'll see later on. They are just embedding it within the current test and expanding it to, to other grade levels. In grades three through eight, the mathematics and reading PSSA is continuing as it has. It is based on the current assessment anchor content standards, not the Pennsylvania Common Core, which is what Dr. Carney was using. <coughs> grades three through five will have embedded field test items aligned, however, to the Pennsylvania Common Core. Um, we will not get specific information back on those questions to see how our students do on those questions, but they will be embedded within the test. Um, the test is going to be offered online and paper and pencil. Unfortunately, it does not matter which method you choose to take the test, the results will still be given in the manner in which they're given now. In other words, it doesn't speed up your response if you happen to be able to get it online. Grade five and eight will be taking the writing PSSA. It is based on current assessment anchors, uh, the content standards. It is not the Pennsylvania Common Core English Language Arts Standards. Again, it is also offered on line and paper pencil as far as administering the test. Also this year, grades four and eight will be taking the science PSSA. This is based on current assessment anchors as the others and it is also offered online and paper and pencil. Grades three through five will be taking the standalone writing field test. 
this is only offered on paper and pencil, and the state feels strongly that this is uh, the best way to um, analyze uh, this performance. Results will be used to implement a writing component into the proposed three through five English language arts assessment um, in the future. Keystone exams. Uh, this is one of the uh, major significant changes um, in the upcoming school year. Um, we have uh, taken uh, Keystone exams in 2011 uh, for some students who completed the algebra and the biology courses. However, this year, in place of the 11th grade PSSA test, the Keystone exams will now be used for all juniors to determine AYP for this coming school year, for this school year. So all students in their junior year will be taking a Keystone exam in the mathematics, algebra specific, uh, the literature, language arts, and in science or biology specific. The biology is not going to count towards AYP, it counts for participation, but the other two will count for the high school AYP for 2013. The schedule for these, and, and you are all well aware that most juniors have taken these courses, specifically algebra and biology, um, generally in their ninth or 10th grade year. We do have a few students who tested uh, previous, but not very many. So there is a process now in place, and um, hopefully next month, Mr. Lacasio can speak to the process that's being put into place to review for these students to take these tests. Um, I had an opportunity to hear um, a uh, Pennsylvania Department of Ed representative speak, and uh, she made very clear that the reason that the Keystone exams are what is determining AYP across the state this year was budget, that they could not afford to do the PSSA 11th grade and the Keystone exams one had to go, so the PSSA 11th grade test went, and the Keystone exams are what is being used to determine AYP for um, the junior class this year. So how much class time do we lose with all this? Well, there's a chart at the end that shows all the testing. It kind of gives a, a line. Um, uh, so you hold off on that question, and, and you'll get, I think, a, a more concrete like sample of, of everything. Um, also, uh, this is kind of a follow-up to what I just said. The Keystone exam is used for two purposes. Uh, the proposed state requirement that the class of 2017 and beyond will demonstrate proficiency for the purpose of graduation. There is conversation, obviously, if you are not proficient or advanced on a Keystone exam, what happens? There is a project-based assessment that um, is being reviewed and discussed. Um, there was a question at a conference we were at on Friday about what that looks like, and truly, it's still in um, the stages of development. So uh, to be able to give a perfect answer for that one at this point is important. Um, this is accountability for CLB, as you're all aware, and it does determine our adequate yearly progress, which is our AYP. As far as the juniors, all of them must take all three Keystone exams. And all non-11th grade students, so if I'm a freshman and I'm taking algebra, I will be taking the Keystone exam and hopefully becoming proficient or advanced and having completed that piece of my 11th grade component after taking the course. Um, as I referenced before, most of our juniors have taken these courses quite a few years ago. And so it's the piece of taking that specific content course at this time. Only 11th grade results will be used to calculate the AYP and a non-11th grade students' results will be banked and then when they get to be juniors, <coughs> they will be part of the AYP for that specific year. Um, if an 11th grade student took an exam back in 2011 as a ninth grader, and they scored advanced or proficient, as I mentioned before, those results do count towards that AYP for <coughs> the school year for them presently being juniors. A student who took that test back when and did not score advanced or proficient as a ninth grader will retest as an 11th grade student this year. So you have 
different groups of students being tested in the Keystone exams this year. And last, um, as a state requirement, uh, the eighth graders right now um, are the first class that will be required to demonstrate proficiency in algebra, upper one, literature, and biology Keystone exams to graduate in the class of 2017. And there is a proposal moving forward to add keystones to that, but those are necessarily budget items at the state level to develop those keystone tests. Dr. Zorch? These tests hold true for private school? They no. So Greensboro Center Path doesn't have to pass a keystone? No. No, they do not. Well, yeah. And I think it should be reiterated <coughs> that members of school boards across the state in an attempt to preserve what has become a myth of local control in the state have fought the idea that the state dictates not only the requirements for graduation from our local high schools, but the test by which that proficiency is demonstrated. And that was a complete loser as far as the state legislature is concerned, and we all know that the state legislature has nothing in mind but good education for students in Pennsylvania. Do cyber charter schools have to pass? They take them. They take them. Yes. Do they have to pass them? Um, I think there is one cyber charter school that made AYP this year. Mm -hmm. um, there was a change. If you saw the little article in the newspaper, um, I don't know if it was Saturday or Sunday, and um, at PASA, the, the school administrators group, um, the formula, the method by which a cyber charter school can make AYP was changed summarily uh, this past summer, and they are now applying to the federal level for that to be approved, and there was some discussion about that. Well, um, I think the challenge with that is the fact that do they, if they do not meet AYP, they still have to go through this same school planning process uh, that's involved. But because their students choose to go there, from my understanding, they do not face the same sanctions that, that we do as a public school. Because their students, from what I was told, their students already have choice and they get the opportunity to be there or not be there. So they don't face the same the sanctions. I think when you get to hear Mr. Lacasio speak, um, one of the concerns at the high school level is the windows that are there for the taking of the Keystone exams this uh, fall. Uh, the, they call it waves of testing. December 3rd through the 14th and January 9th through the 23rd is considered wave one and then there's a wave in May and then obviously um, make up in June, July and August. Um, we are hoping to test all of our students in the December wave. And obviously, we're also hoping that we can um, get students ready to take the test and to take it seriously as they move forward with these. Um, there's now plans as far as how we're going to take them and all of those kinds of things, which we will um, come back to all of you and, and talk about that. Um, so that is the window. <coughs> From the first wave, uh, December and January, we expect to receive those March. results in March. I will tell you that we received our, our results late this summer, and so I, I, I'm not sure as to, to if that will be received on, on time. But the challenge is, you, took, you learn whether students passed or did not pass, or, uh, and then you have a very short window to remediate between that notification and the actual administration of the next assessment on May 13th through the 24th. So it poses some, some remediation challenges. Does it give you enough time to register those students for the test in May? Um, I can answer that. Yeah. yeah. Um, we can order enough test booklets, but we, we won't know in order to acquire um, the pre-code labels. So the students that retake in May will have to uh, bubble in all their information. And there again lies opportunity for errors matching numbers so it's going to be it'll be some um, labor intensive but there was a deadline to register for the december test. right, right. what you're saying that yes they will allow these kids to register um right the registration they we just won't be have enough time to order pre-code labels for them. 
Did they not ask us to anticipate the, the percentage of students who, who we believe would not pass and order that many tests? But we haven't ordered those tests. That window hasn't opened yet. So, okay. but. And do we have to pay for those tests? No. Okay. Um, I've been hearing for, for months that um, the Pennsylvania Department of Ed plans to apply for new annu annual measurable objectives. Um, we haven't seen that yet. You have an article in front of you regarding um, 44, uh, 43 states and the District of Columbia who have applied for waivers um, to NCLB to the federal level. Um, I think 34 or something um, have received information back regarding that. Pennsylvania has not chosen to uh, apply for those. Currently, for this school year, uh, the target for math is 89% and the target for reading is 91% uh, advanced or proficient. Uh, the recommendation, all students not taking a Keystone-related course should take the Keystone exams in the winter window. Again, this year, um, obviously, Almost all of our students have already taken these courses, so hence we are in the winter window. This gives you the chart that Mr. Palmer was asking, um, dates of testing throughout the year for various groups. And as I referenced at the beginning and, and wanted you to keep in mind um, that we have 181 days of instruction and when you count up, and I haven't counted, uh, the number of days of instruction that are lost because we're testing um, various groups, it is significant. And uh, uh, no one would argue the importance of uh, assessing achievement and knowing where we are, um, but there is quite a bit. And the proposal, um, as you move forward, and if you look forward um, from PDE as far as what their perspective is of testing, they hope to add numerous Keystone exams over the years. So um, that will also be additional to this. And that's just a summary. When you see access for ELLs, that yes. is an assessment for students who are um, here speaking another language, and so we have to monitor their progress in English. English, English. The next chart really is a summary of what we already talked about. I'm not going to necessarily go through it, but if you're familiar with what we do now, that's the column on the left. Um, or what's new, excuse me, and on the right is what's going to be the same from the other years, and you can look at that yourself. Um, performance targets. Um, I don't know if all of you remember where you were when NCLB was approved in 2002. I do. Um, but back then, um, the targets were 35% and 45%. And I can remember very, very clearly thinking, wow, by 2014, um, you know, someone will have changed this. Um, and I think probably almost every educator has no problem and, and truly recognizes the need uh, to improve instruction, to improve uh, the assessment, to make sure that all the students are learning. Um, but we are now in 2012, 2013, hard to believe, and those targets are there. And the following year, 2013, 14, as of this date, 100% um, efficiency is the target um, for all public schools across the state. Um, you are probably also aware, and, and Dr. Kreiner is going to go through some specific data, but we talk about AYP all the time, and, and actually, last year at graduation, Mr. Ocasio had a wonderful um, speech regarding AYP and that it's not all about assessment. Um, but this slide tells you, in the eyes of numbers, what happens if a school does not meet its AYP. As we referenced last month, the Greater Latrobe School District, as a district, did make annual yearly progress. We have two buildings that are in the warning stage, and Dr. Parnell will talk about that a little bit more. Um, for the most part, subgroups and other things. But in the first year of not making or meeting <laughs> AYP, um, you are in warning status, which I remember seeing in numerous newspapers, lists of schools and so on in various status, um, various um, status that each of them are in. Uh, simply meaning, warning means that the school fell short of those targets for that particular year. Um, 
Basically, it moves forward if you do not meet AYP the following year. Um, if it is in mourning for two consecutive years, meaning they haven't made AYP, it is uh, deemed as needing improvement. And then you go to the categories that follow. And you might have, when you saw, <coughs> have seen many of the articles in the newspaper, it lists various schools and in various pieces. Uh, or stages, school improvement one, school improvement two, corrective action, and so on. I will not um, read this for you or in any way bore you with that. Um, but as you can look through here, school improvement one, which is at the top, it talks about if you don't make AYP in two years, talk about school choice and other things that make students eligible at that point. One of the things that you hear probably a lot about <coughs> are subgroups. And these are groups that have more than 40, 40 or more students. Now the ones that are in red are the groups that Greater Latrobe has. And obviously as you go across the state, um, many schools have all of these subgroups, um, maybe none of the subgroups except one. But we obviously have the white non-Hispanic. We have the IEP, not in all our buildings, and Dr. Prime, when he goes over the stores, you'll see that. IEP means the Individualized Education Plan <coughs> Special Education. And the economically disadvantaged subgroups are the three that impact Greater Latrobe. <coughs> How performance is calculated, I'm going to let Dr. Prino explain to you the different methods. Um, it is not straight target, the 89 and 91. There are basically three other ways that you can make AYP. Um, and when you see some of our targets for this year, you'll see that some of the schools that made it made it in some of these methods. You'll see, you can meet it outright. When you meet it outright, outright that's stats. You, you achieve it, you achieve the benchmark for the target, and you need nothing else. With anything, there's statistics. And when you're looking at tests and assessments and the statistics that come along with it, there's error. And just like you might see it in an election poll that, that says uh, plus minus 5% so forth and so on. Uh, and that plus minus number varies based upon the number of people surveyed. So if you've surveyed a greater number of people, the probability that that is accurate is greater. But if you survey less people, the standard of error is far greater. So the same sort of holds true with assessments. The more kids that you have that you assess, the smaller that band is in terms of error. So the target may be 81%. But if you're at 79 and that and that bar or that standard error plus minus 6%, you've still met it because you've fallen within that confidence interval. Greater the trope, being a larger district in terms of this, tests more kids, so our band is, is smaller. Whereas some other schools that, that you'll see, you'll see, you'll see say, wait, our score was higher than, than school X, Y, or Z. How can they make it when we don't? Well, our band of error is smaller, <laughs> and their, their band of error is larger. And so that's one of the things that they look at. The other thing they do is they take it to a two-year calculation. They know that classes vary based upon their performance. And so, they, so the other thing they'll do is they'll take two years worth of data to determine whether the average of the two meets the target performance. And then they also do the same thing with the confidence interval around the two years worth of data. The next area we'll see is safe harbor. And what safe harbor means is that your students have seen a 10% increase in moving from not meeting AYP to meeting AYP. So 10% of your students have moved. The next thing, the next area is safe harbor with a confidence interval, and we talked about confidence interval. It's the same thing. 10% of your students have moved into meeting that AYP to an advanced proficient range. And the last, the bottom, when you look at the charts, is growth model. And what that does is it looks at all your students as a whole, it pulls your cohort, 
and looks at that cohort, and through various statistical methods, they look and determine whether your students as a whole have experienced enough growth to met AYP. That you know, a lot of times you look at this in a, in a school system that may have uh, high socioeconomic uh, percentage of students, urban, in, in the cities. And so a lot of their kids are coming in and they're basic or below basic, but they experience significant growth from year to year, and that's in there to help uh, those schools, or schools that are not meeting growth, uh, show that they're, they're doing a, uh, an appropriate job with their students, what providing appropriate education. Does that come from the PVOS data? That does come through, through the PVOS data. So that's on the PVOS website. Right. Yeah. They, they use that to, to come up with their growth calculation. Uh, once again, as you know with PVOS, they will not release the, the statistics or how they determine how they get those numbers. So if you ask me to explain to you or tell you what the formula was to get to determine growth, uh, I couldn't and I don't have access to it. I get a general understanding of how that works. Okay. Uh, it's really that your cohort's relative position uh, in comparison to all the other cohorts from across the state and where they sit percentile rank and if they moved appropriately, whether they gained ground, lost ground, or maintained the same level and an appropriate amount of growth over the course of a year in terms of their scale scores and, and those types of things, that determines whether there is growth, significant growth or not. And so uh, at some point at, at another board meeting, we will get into some, some PVOS data. I'm sure you're excited to see that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, James, yes. that, that same harbor, <clears throat> if, they, if they meet that criteria, they stay in that same category. Then once they, and they continue to grow, once, is there a, is there a specific guidelines for them to make it, you know, jump to another category? It really, it has to, it, it all surrounds those students so that are basic and below basic, moving into to that proficient, category or the advanced category. And so what they're looking for with Safe Harbor is 10% of their students. And so a lot of times what, what schools do and what, what we're doing is you target, you, you do a 2020 analysis. You, you look at the, those 20 students that are above that, that line, closest to being uh, basic. You look at those, student, those 20 students who are right below, right below proficient. And you target them and to make sure they're going students don't fall, but also to push those students uh, to go after the safe harbor. And so it really is a, is a numbers game in terms of, a lot of this you'll see is a numbers game in terms of allocations and, and percentages that fall within uh, uh, those categories outside of just flat out making the performance mark. You will see, uh, you will see sometimes schools within a district do not meet AYP, but the district itself will meet AYP. Uh, when you look at you, when you look at Greater Latrobe, and that's because there are so many ways for a district to have to meet AYP or not meet AYP. But when you look at it in terms of grade spans, when we look at, at our district, we met it in the three to five grade span, we met it in the six to eight grade span. But, and that's all your schools combined in that grade span, three to five, then six to eight. And you'll see with the six to eight, that encompasses two levels in our school system, both the elementary and the junior high school. In the high school, you will see that we did not, we met for participation, but we did not meet it for performance in math or reading. Now when you break that down, and we'll get into this a little bit later, when you look at performance, that includes your overall performance, but also involves all those subgroups that Mrs. Swagger re referenced earlier. And so when you look at mathematics, we did not meet it outright or through the criteria overall, and we did not meet it for our socioeconomically disadvantaged. When you look at our reading, we met the reading overall, but we did not meet it for our socioeconomically disadvantaged students. And so when you take a look at that, even though we didn't meet it in those two areas, we did meet it overall as a district. And so therefore our district made AYP. 
I'm going to go through the specific results, uh, grade level by grade level, for last year. And if you take a look uh, at the overall percent efficient, when you look at our reading, 83.8% of our students were proficient in reading. And that, in and of itself, meets, the, meets AYP at a status level. When you look at mathematics, we're 86.9%. And that also meets mathematics benchmark for targets outright or by status. When you take a look at our fourth grade, once again in reading, we met it outright in terms of status at 82.7%. Mathematics were at 88.1% and science at 93.1%. Take a look at our math and our science scores. 59.7% of our students are scoring at the advanced range in terms of math and 65.2% in science. So it shows their strength within the curriculum. Uh, and if you, if you look at reading, 47.1% met it. And you see the, the basic group at 11.9. So as you look at that, and you read it across the chart, you know that you have some curricular strength, and the fact that 47% of your students are advanced. But there, and there are a concern, are those students at the basic level, the below basic level, and uh, looking at how you're targeting them and meeting their needs. Fifth grade. Fifth grade, you'll see our reading scores at 73.2%, our math 86.8, and our writing at 81.2. Sixth grade, you can see that 38.7% of our students were advanced. In reading, 35 proficient, 18% basic, and 8.2% below basic for 73.7% of our students at or above proficient. <coughs> Math, that number is 89.4 with 68%, 68.6% of our students being advanced, 20.8% being proficient. Once again, over half of our students in sixth grade are advanced in mathematics. Grade 7 results, 85.5% in reading and the mathematics were at 86%. With over half of our students, over 50% advanced in reading and over 66% advanced in math. We take a look at our 8th grade math, for reading, math, science, and writing. You see that 88.7% of our students are advanced in reading, I'm sorry, proficient or above in reading. 67% are advanced in reading. 58% advanced in mathematics with 85.7 overall. You take a look at our science with 74.7% of our students at or above proficient. And when you look at writing, 17.6% are advanced, 72.8% of our students are proficient, with a total of 9.4. Finally, with 11th grade, our reading was at 78.4, with 49% of our students advanced, 29.4% <coughs> proficient, 13.5% basic, and 8.1% below basic. You take a look at our mathematics, 71.3% are at or above proficient, with 44.8% advanced, 26.5% proficient, 17% basic, and 16 or 11.6% below basic. Science, 57.8% of our students were at or above proficient on the science assessment, with 27.5% being advanced, 30.4% proficient, 36.9% basic, 5.2 below basic. And finally, with writing, 97.4% of our students were advanced or proficient in writing, with 20% being advanced, 77.2% proficient, and 2.6% being basic. 
I find it to be interesting that there's such a discrepancy between your writing and your reading scores and the level of that. Uh, some, some people say that that's an indicative of the rig rigorousness of both assessments, one writing not being as, as rigorous and the other side of the reading being so rigorous. But when you look at it from a, from a developmental standpoint, the discrepancy that you see between reading and writing <coughs> is so great that it, it causes me to, to wonder why that is. Okay. Yes? I actually saw different statistics um, at all the ones I've looked at. I saw our math at 73.4. Have you seen that? I have. Uh, it came out of our IU. Uh, this is right off of e-metrics. Okay. And so, so this is right. This is from the state. So this is more. Accurate. This is more accurate. Well, you know, and we have seen that we've gotten different numbers from the state, but this is right off. That that is a cut and paste right out of the e-metrics from the from the PDE. Okay. So. Where does the IU get their data? That I I'm, not, I'm not certain. So. Right. You. You get different types of data when you include different things. So they may or may not have include, included the PSSA modified or the passive results in, in their score calculations. And so if you leave out one of those, that'll change that, that result. But I, I did see that out of the IU. So, but I wanted to get right with the e metric because that's... You know, that's okay. Getting into our individual schools, you will see Bangor Elementary School, Met AYP, 79% of uh, overall reading. Uh, students met AYP in terms of reading, 88% mathematics. When you look at the special edu education population, 57% of the special edu education students met AYP uh, for reading, and 72% for math, and socioeconomic disadvantage. 67% were proficient, were advanced in reading, and 79% in math. The attendance rate of Bagley was 95%. Trevor Elementary School, overall reading, 71%. Overall math, 86%. Special education reading was 53%. Math, 72%. Social economic disadvantage, 62% reading, and 79% math with 95% overall. Mondo Elementary School was at 87% for reading and 92% for math overall. You will note that they <coughs> did not or do not have a special education subgroup. So for calculating AYP, that is not included. Socioeconomically disadvantaged, 78% for reading and 63% for math and attendance at 95%. You will, as you may have seen, in the local newspaper, uh, it identified Montview Elementary School as not meeting AYP. Our preliminary results indicated they did not. Going back in the data, we uh, filed an appeal based on allocation of students in terms of the, uh, the accreditation or who would, the accreditation of students from the, uh, we took the pass up. The movement went. What happens with that? You have one percent. It's, you know, it's, it's complicated. You're allowed to test as many special education students as you want, uh, based upon their IEP requirements and so forth, with the pass up. But you're only allowed to count one percent of them as passing. So even if they pass, they're they can't be attributed as failing. And Overall, we make that calculation, and honestly, we make the calculation blind uh, in the sense that we do not have all that, the data at the time to, to make those allocations. So it's the law of probability. You look, noticing that Miami does not have a special education subgroup, you obviously don't attribute as many of those students as passing in Mountain View. We ask, uh, because of circumstances, about getting the assessments back late and so forth, errors were made you know, uh, along the way that PD reconsider that. And, uh, you know, this is why it has a letter. 
So we reattributed one student as passing in Mount View, which put us over. Uh, we met AYP for socioeconomically disadvantaged. And so now Mount View has met AYP. So that will not be corrected on the website until January because if they don't do this, they only do that rollover twice a year. The next one's set for January. Junior high school, <laughs> reading overall 87% and math at 86%. The junior high, <coughs> high school did not meet AYP, however, because of special education. Uh, at reading, they were at 59% and at math, 50%. So in both of those areas, they did not meet it for students with special needs. Social economically disadvantaged students, uh, we were at 76% for reading and 74% for math and our overall attendance was at 95%. And you'll see the high school, 79% for reading overall, and 71% for math. Special education is not a subgroup at our high school. Social and economically disadvantaged students were at 55% for reading and 41% for math. So the three areas that we didn't make it were overall math and social economically disadvantaged for reading and for math. Our graduation rate sits at 95%, the target being 85. And that's it, that's it. This is our PSA results for 2012. <coughs> Questions? Uh, just look at Coming out of junior high, with socioeconomically socio disadvantaged at 76 and 74, and then it drops so drastically when we go to the high school. Why is that? What would cause that? If they're, I mean, they're making a great year. Is it a difference in the curriculum when they get to the high school? Or is it just a number of things? Well, I, think, I think it's not just one thing. I think, I think there's, a, there's several things. Exposure to higher level of uh, higher levels of the curriculum is, is an issue. Safety nets once you get to the high school or less uh, because students are more independent and and so forth. And so that's one of the things that, that uh, you'll see later on Mr. Ocasio, Mr. Kralik, and Mr. Shivas are doing, is they're, they're working right now to build those safety nets and make those safety nets stronger to catch those students who uh, aren't exposed to the more rigorous curriculum that's required. I mean, if I showed you the PSSA assessment, it's very rigorous. And uh, so that exposure, and then the safety nets in terms of identifying students who are at risk of, of, of academic academically not meeting that AYP and you know, you utilize especially design instruction and targeting targeting instruction to, to meet their their academic needs. One of the things that when you take a test in eighth grade and then there's no PSSA test until the junior year, there's very little comparable data nice. from eighth grade to eleventh grade. And and truly we've searched and, and there's not much um, many assessments out there that give you any kind of indication as to performance. Um, and when you talk to elementary teachers, that's far different um, in the elementary buildings. I also, at the high school level, um, you know, you're, you're speaking of career pathways, you're talking about electives. You, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a different um, approach. It's a less prescribed curriculum. Yeah, and, and, and I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. Um, but. I'm going to editorialize a little bit. <laughs> I think that. Uh, the main goal of public education is to help each child reach their maximum potential. That is my consideration of why I'm interested in public education. And I frankly think you do a pretty good job, probably better than we did when I was in school, which wasn't, well, actually, a long time ago. <laughs> this is a political effort to destroy public education, in my opinion. I think that's what all this is. All this testing, all this rigor roll all this crap that goes on just to make everyone look bad. If you look at how schools were run years ago, all you do is go to eighth grade and then you can quit. And none of those kids were ever tested again. You know, you get, if any, anybody watched the movie Caddyshack, you know, the lawyer says in there, you know, the world needs ditch figures too. I'm not saying that to be disrespectful to anybody, but it's frankly the truth. We're expected to teach everybody to a degree that frankly is untenable. When you see 100% proficiency, 
everyone in this room, everyone who feels anything with anything, knows it's never going to happen. Ever, never, never. And one of the basic tenets of problem and statistics or biology is a bell-shaped curve. And a bell-shaped curve, for anything, has it in a, the top end that people can't make. There are some people that will never make it, no matter what you do. The goal is, for us, is to help those kids even to reach their maximum potential. There's nothing wrong with that. There is nothing wrong with that. That is what is missing from this whole political discussion about public education right now. They're leaving that all out. All they're doing is making us concentrate on this BS that says we are failing our children. Now, there's nothing wrong with striving to be the best and making sure that we're doing the best and making sure that we're doing the best we can for all kids. Now, there's nothing wrong with it. What is wrong with it is making it this. This is wrong. This is totally a bunch of crap. I don't even care about those numbers. I frankly don't. The numbers I care about is, what did this kid do last year and what is he doing this year? What do we do to help this kid do the best that he can the next year? How are we helping kids that don't like school do better in school? How are we helping the kids that love school get better in school? That's what we're missing in this whole thing too. When you look at statistics from a couple years ago, the high achieving kids were achieving less high than they were five years ago. Something is wrong with that as well. When you have our politicians tell us, well, let's take kids out of public education so that we can put them in private school so they can do better, but these guys are telling us how to us to be better. How are they, how does this fit? How do people who are running this whole show say that we're not doing a good job and they're the ones that are putting the rules in place for us to run it? Where does that come from? How does that make any sense to anyone? It makes no sense to me. So the most important things I listen to when we have these meetings and we have discussions is what are we doing to help the kids? What are we doing to make it better? And that's the key to this whole thing. As far as I'm concerned, we can take this off of thing and throw it in the garbage can. I don't care. I really don't. What I want to know is what are we doing to help kids? And that's what I'm going to pay attention to. When somebody comes up to me and asks me a question, why aren't our social economically disadvantaged kids not doing as well as they should? Well, ask their parents that too. Please ask them. Please ask them why they didn't put emphasis on education and want their kids to do better. Why are we taking those things out of the context? There's a whole spectrum of things that impact what a kid does in school. We aren't their parents. We aren't living with these kids. We're not doing everything for these kids. We are educating kids. And if we're doing the best we can to educate them, then I think that's what we're doing. I'm sorry, sometimes things are tough. Everybody has it tough. Frankly, when I went to school, if I came home with a bad grade, my dad would have kicked my ass up around my neck. Because that wasn't how I was raised. I was raised to do the best I could. There were lots of kids in my school district, it was actually a poor school district, who did very well and went on to do wonderful things because the emphasis from that group of people was for the kids to do well. But it was the parents that wanted it too. So we have to, I don't know how we politicize that. How do we get that argument out in the public that says, look, we can only do so much, but the community has to do something. What does a community mean? It means the parents, it means the community, it means everything involved with these kids. So that's my political statement. That's where I stand. I, I really wish that we as local school districts had more impact on what happens in our education. It's being taken away from us. It really is. It's disgusting to me. It's just, that should be disgusting to everyone in this room who has a kid in school that your education of your kids is being taken away from you and taken care of by a federal government or a state government is totally removed from your community. You know, these decisions are being made based on school districts that aren't your school district. I know there are poor school districts in this state that aren't performing well. I know there are poor school districts in this country that aren't performing well. But please look at the school district that they're talking about. Are they talking about my school district? No, they're not. 
Are they talking about their school district? They're not. If you look at every school district in this county, they're not talking mostly about their school districts. They're talking about school districts that have very, very serious problems that really don't start with the school. I wish someone in leadership position in our state or federal government would say that, but nobody wants to say it. Everybody wants to be politically correct and not say what actually needs to be said. When people have drug problems or alcohol problems, you don't have parents in the house who are being raised by kids who are out on the street running around and don't go to school, or they mug their teachers or beat their teachers up, or disrespect their teachers or trash their schools, how do you educate those kids? What do you do? How do you help those people? Somebody needs to talk to them. It's not a school problem, it's a community problem. My community is a good community. We have a wonderful community for the most part. There are problems. I know because I see them every day in my job. I really do. And they exist in this community. So from my standpoint, we're doing pretty doggone good by doing this thing. We help try to help those kids. I hear how we try to help them every time we talk about these problem kids. We're trying our best. But we can't fix everything. And please, as a public, please take over your schools again. Don't let these guys take them away from you. Because that's what's happening. The next thing that's going to happen is it won't be very good to throw the school district anymore. It'll be, I don't know. Maybe, maybe worse than that. We don't know. So somebody write your congressman, somebody write their governor, tell them, please let us take care of our schools. Because we've done a good job up until this point. If we have to read 100% proficiency, they're going to take us over because you aren't going to make it. I'm telling you, it's not going to happen. Never. But what school district is? How Nobody are they going is. to take over all of them? Nobody's going to take over. No. 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 Well, that, but that's the biggest political issue. What is their plan? What do they want to do? The problem is we take the money from them. You don't take the money from them, you tell them to go to hell. That's the problem. <laughs> when you start, when you take the money, you're going to go along with their game. You don't take their money. Just like the just like the side of the private side. You never know. Don't let us miss the significance of this little article that we have here. Forty-four states have asked for flexibility, waivers. Some think not Pennsylvania. Now you look at Pennsylvania, there are 500 school districts in Pennsylvania. They're very different from each other. You look at the cost of living areas going across Pennsylvania. Each of them is very different from the other. And yet it's all one thing and nobody is looking at it all and saying that because these areas are different, because these districts are different, because Everything has differences socioeconomically, educationally, in our state. Maybe we are one of the 44 states like, who like to have waivers. What is the matter with our State Department of Education? What political agenda are they working on? From what I was told, that I don't know if it's true or not. I heard that they thought that it was going to be instituted no matter what, so they weren't going to take the time to bother to apply. So 44 other states had time <coughs> to realize it wasn't happening and put the waivers in, but Pennsylvania was too busy doing something else. Exactly. Sure. The statement that that question was actually asked on Friday at, at a meeting Judy and I were, were attending with PD, uh, their statement was that if you apply for the waiver and they change the AMO, uh, annual me measurement objective, so they, they change the target. At that point, if you don't make it, shame on you. But if they leave it at 100% and you don't make it, then shame on the law because we know it's flawed. <laughs> But the problem here is that it is not a game. It is not, 
it is not people sitting in some place far away from our children and moving around numbers on a computer. This is about what happens to each of our kids every day. This is what happens when we have kids who are so uptight about the fact that they have to take PSSAs this week. This is, this is real. This happens in each of our parents' homes. <coughs> this is not something that's happening on a computer in Harrisburg or Washington, D.C., but it really is something that's happening on a computer in Harrisburg or Washington, D.C. You're right. I've actually seen special ed students sit there with that test and cry because they know the pressure they're under to do well on it and they can't do it. I've seen it. And, you know, it's just, it's just a shame. You know, the, the, I think the definition of special ed is you have to be functioning two grade levels below where you're supposed to be, but yet they expect these students to take the test at the level that they're, they are, they're supposed to be, they rather than the two grade right, levels if, if below. If those students were going to be proficient on the PSSA, we would, we would need to move them out of special education. <coughs> yeah. Oh. So, you know, they, they define special ed to be one thing, but they expect a different performance on a test. Now, how does that happen? None of it makes any sense. Uh, all this, I've seen so many statistics. I've been looking at everything. You know, none of it comes together correctly. It, it just, I, I saw a statistic where actually we were either fifth or sixth in the county as far as the percentage of students proficient or advanced in mathematics. But yet those students, those, some of those districts below us made AYP and we didn't. That makes no sense to me at all. It makes no sense. I, I can't, I don't even know how that's to interpret that. That's the safe harbor and the Hawkins and, and, and But see, I, I think from what I've been told, because we did so well the year before, we were at 77, we grew like 7% that year. Mm -hmm. So that prohibited us from making safe harbor this year. Right. So they're punishing yeah. us because we did so well the year before and happened to drop a little bit this year. So some of the other schools that did that made Safe Harbor because they didn't do as well the year before. Mm -hmm. One it of makes the most no ridiculous sense. things I've read recently, and I forget who wrote this article, but I, I read these things and sent from the state all the time. Mm -hmm. And one of the pitches for <laughs> sending your kid on a voucher to a private school or some other school is, that they don't have to teach to the same standards that the public school does. Mm -hmm. What, what, where does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. How does that make sense to anybody? How does that make sense that they don't teach to the same standard? What does that mean? Well, I'll tell you what it means. It means you can take the creativity away from somebody because they have to teach to a test now. We have to teach to a program that is given to us so the teacher can't take the next step or can't do something different or is actually afraid to do something creative to make kids think because it's not going to be on the test. So the charter schools or the private schools or whatever, they can do those kind of things. They can have teachers come in and do a couple days about something else that isn't going to be on a test that might make kids think about things a little bit differently. Whereas our teachers have 30 days of testing that they have to worry about that's taken out of their curriculum. So any days that they do have to be creative and do something more fun, it's taken away from them because they have to do this stupid test stuff. So but we have people in our state government saying these kinds of things. Come on, guys. You're the guys telling us what we have to do. But you're telling us if you don't like, like it, you, you should probably take your kid out of it because we're not doing a good enough job. That's how I look at it. They're screwing us up to make us have to do something else because of the standards they're setting for them. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't sound right to me. It doesn't make any sense to me. I don't understand it. I don't understand why. I think I know why they wanted to fail because this all this thing of school choice. But in my opinion, school choice is a bad thing because when you have a good public education system, everybody has a chance. It doesn't matter how much money you make, it doesn't matter where you live, it doesn't matter anything about that thing. Everybody's given an opportunity to succeed because they have a good public school. And they do what they can with it, and they do what they can. They have a personal responsibility, the family has a personal responsibility to take that education that's free, really isn't free because we're paying taxes for it, but we're not paying extra money to go there, and we have it for 
us. It's available to everyone. And they want to take that away from us. No, they're dealing with Philadelphia and they're dealing with Pittsburgh and other places. They're not worried about the area living here. That's why they're looking at that. And we're thrown in with them. So on November 6th is when you have to decide what you do when you walk in. Sorry. Thank you very much. Anyone else have a question or a comment?
what it is, why it is, that sort of thing. Yes. And it would be a really good learning experience for all of you and for me as well. Uh, the postage meter lease renewal is item number five in your packet and that will be on the agenda. The information that you need to vote on that is there. And then um, Act 1 index timeline is item number six in your packet and um, that's information. And I think that's the end of my report unless somebody has some questions. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Elder. Um, Mrs. Kozar is in here this evening. Um, property and Supply Committee meeting. Um, uh, the next meeting is the 8th of November. Uh, May I correct that the, 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 month, the meeting for October is this Thursday, October 11th. We had to cancel last week. So it's this Thursday at 3 p.m. at the Avenue. And then that will be the meeting. Thank you. Um, opening of vehicle bids will be, um, or was today at 11 a.m. as Ken said, and we will we will award that bid at our next meeting on the 23rd. And uh, permission to advertise for the what I call for boilers will be in agenda item also. <coughs> Any questions there? Dr. Walkman's not here this evening. Um, the fall sports recognition um, that will be. Yeah, it's going to be December 10th. And then it sounds late, but the reason we're waiting for the auditorium to be renovated, and that's as early as we can get in there to have the you know, thing at the auditorium. You said that was a Monday? Yeah, it's a Monday evening. And I picked the day it works to be open, but there's also no winter events that night, so all athletes should be able to attend the games that night. And real quick, the golf team won today. They were in the state semis, or I mean, the WPL team semis where they compete against nine schools in the top three move on Thursday. The Cherry Creek Golf Course, they actually <coughs> finished first, five strokes ahead. Going into the final is Thursday at the Cherry Creek. Okay, Eric,
Our meeting minutes from our last meeting, 9 11, are in your packages, item number 11. And the next meeting, uh, we had the uh, meeting today at uh, 6 p.m. Um, and the uh, meeting minutes will follow next week. Superintendent's recommendations, Mrs. Weiser. I would ask the board to move on a resolution this evening. It's number 085, which is the resignations of two people, Lori Garris, food service employee, and Dolly Dalcoons, junior <coughs> high school family and consumer science teacher. So moved. Seconded. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the resolution number 85. Um, members of the audience, um, we did not give you any opportunity to speak before the meeting, but since we are voting on this resolution this evening, if anyone would like to address the board about these resignations, um, please approach the podium and um, give us your name and address. <coughs> okay, seeing none. It has been moved and seconded then that we adopt resolution number 85. Any comments or questions from board members? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed, say nay. That passes unanimously. And the other items we would ask to vote on uh, at October 23rd, uh, they are with the additional substitute teachers as well as the uh, support personnel positions that are listed in the agenda. And uh, we would ask to approve an extra duty the junior high school musical production advisor at the October 23rd. Other business is listed there. The um, Bagley Elementary School Friendship Breakfast, the dates are listed. Um, girls Field Hockey Senior Rec Recognition Night, 10-16-12 uh, from Memorial Stadium. Breakfast of Champions at the High School is Thursday, October 18th at 7 a.m. in the back of the dining room. And uh, so everybody remembers, I know we've all been saying next week, next week, which is usual, but our next meeting will be October the 23rd at 7.30 with an executive session at 6.30. So there will be no meeting next week. It will be held the following Tuesday on the 23rd. Um, yeah, two things. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to be able to attend the breakfast of champions because I'll be otherwise occupied. And the on the, on the door when we were coming in to play uh, is, <coughs> is that in October? Is that at the end of October? The dates are on there. Um, yes. 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 Well, our meeting will be. Um, I know. The October 23rd meeting will be on the other side because they will have set up in this yes. room. Um, but we can still have a meeting here. It's just we have to be on the side by the room with the with the here. So. Okay. And um, can we call and ask for tickets or? Um, Because it, it's very small. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Anything else to come before the board this evening? No? Thank you very much for your time, and we'll see you on the 23rd.